What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a special edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up here on this gorgeous Saturday, April 27th, 2024. It's been a long week, folks. I appreciate you guys tuning in on this weekend um, to give our special week in review where our team goes ahead and selects some of the top headlines. Lots of great stuff this week, folks. I mean, it was absolutely unbelievable. I had some couple solo shows for myself. So if you're tired of listening to me, I understand not moving forward. But if you need more Tanner or want to hear other things of what you missed this week, tune in. The team's got the line upset um but just as always guys the news and analysis you hear is brought to you by the world's greatest website energynewsbeat.com check us out there i'm gonna go ahead and, and sign off though turn it over to the team we will see you on monday with our latest episode until then folks three offshore wind projects next in new york that's a total of six that were canceled michael three were rebid out at double the price so I went to OSU, but is the same amount of money being stolen from the people? I'm just kidding. No, three wind offshore nicks, uh, and this is kind of funny. Uh, the New York heavy blow to the offshore in a major setback for the climate ambitions. These projects would have delivered four gigawatts to offshore wind, amounting to the most of the New York's 2035 goal. Um it's all about cost. Given these developments, there's no final awards will be made. Um, are are the uh, the news? Blah blah blah. Kathy Hogle is all upset. Well, well what it quote. comes down to is really what happened here was they couldn't come. the 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 maker of these turbines decided not to big a turb a build a big enough turbine to fit what the you know, the, the retrofit what these offshore wind farms was going to do. So instead, you would have to use smaller turbines, which means more of them, which means more expense. And like everything, when you try something new, wind energy is fairly new. It's only been around for 10 years. We've been developing oil and gas for over 100 years now. Things always in the front end cost more. It's why investing in hardware. I'm, I'm a big fan of the uh, the All In podcast. These guys were talking about this little uh, uh, X Apple, this this new company right now that raised 250 million dollars to build a little pin. It's their version of Google Glass, but it's on your pin. No 250 way. million dollars. They built a product that didn't work. Why? Investing in hardware costs so much money. So to think that we're just going to come into this in the first try, get it right, is ridiculous. It applies to anything. So um, that's why you're seeing all these cost overruns. It's absolutely insane. Well, and what's going to happen is, uh, the, as I've talked about with several different other folks on podcasts, the cost overruns have now caught up to them. And you've mentioned this before is that the wind industry is now catching up that they can't constantly go get more money, constantly go get more money. And it's now to a serious point. GE uh, Vernova is the uh, spinoff that you were talking about. Okay. Yeah. This, and, and I mean, but to give you an idea, this was originally going to supply power to, to 10 million homes by 2030, whether or not you believe that number or not. I mean, that's a, pretty lofty goal uh, it's extremely lofty but the part of the problem is that uh, we won't have any whale population by then <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> yeah, that's perfect okay, that made your day hey it's celebration earth day let's get rid of the, the whales exactly they're killing the environment yeah, that's right the biden administration considers scrapping its cutting edge proposal to slash power plant pollution David Blackman has been all over this uh, whole topic uh, very well. And Michael, this article actually came from CNN. That's why when I was reading this, I was kind of like going, huh, even CNN is out there going, the uh, is the scrapping, it's really, really most impactful power plant rules uh, are important. The EPA is going after them because... They've got hydrogen buried into the language as well so that they can use hydrogen along with the coal. And now there are lawsuits coming out saying that hydrogen is more polluting than what is uh, allowed out there. So they're trying to separate it out a little bit and slow it down. Hydrogen is not as clean as they say it is. 
So they're trying to allow a little bit of two-year FUD room so that they can extend some of the uh, coal plants out two years, which is actually brilliant. Yeah, I mean, hydrogen is not here yet, it's clear. Hydrogen oh, no. is not ready to be injected into my car. I'm not sure if I want to be putting hydrogen into my car and turning it into a nuclear weapon, but that's just me, okay? Well, the the rule, this whole the, these rules are all about carbon capture and stemming, and I agree that if you could do carbon cleaning or carbon scrubbing, you could get it down to enough so that it would be less impact on the environment to run a coal plant than to run a wind mill, a wind turbine. Just by doing scrubbing, you don't even have to do the carbon capture. So the EPA is uh, delay the rulemaking uh, on the existing plants, which have been covered. Uh, here is a quote from O'Boyle. One thing we can all count on is the EPA will be sued by aggressive party under this rule. No matter what, <laughs> there will be lawsuits. So I have to hand it to the Biden administration for at least stepping back, taking a cup of tea, holding their their pinky out like they're English and going, um, we're going to get sued. Let's at least take a look at a rule. This is the first time I've heard that in years, Michael. I was pretty pleased. I mean, we've had scrubbers around for years, though. So the fact that like people are resistant to, oh, maybe we shouldn't try to make them better is, is kind of crazy. But you did a great job. Oman LNG signs a 10-year gas supply agreement with Turkey's Botas Petroleum. Michael, this is critical because it dovetails into the previous discussion, mm -hmm. and that is with Oman LNG announced Friday, uh, the Turkey's Botas Petroleum will supply Michael 1 million metric tons per, an, uh, per year of LNG for 10 years. This is huge. Mm -hmm. This is also a subcontract away around sanctions. Turkey, and there is a map that I'm going to um, take a look at. You take a look at Turkey's key infrastructure pipelines that are now in place. It now has its LNG import facility. You can now get into a lot of areas and get Russian LNG gas through this agreement through Oman. Oman and Russia have agreements. Oh... Mm. Yeah, this no, is, this is, ooh. I mean, LNG is becoming the big leverage point around the world. We've seen this is the latest in a string of LNG agreements that Qatar has done, Saudi Arabia has done. So th th there's a continuing reliance. And, and if here at home, we have an export ban, if not, and not an export ban, but we have a ban on building new facilities. If the world is going in the opposite direction, if the world is zigging, we're zagging. And I like that. I love a good zig when you're zag when someone else is zagging. But I actually think in this case, the world is right and we're gone wrong. It's going to it's going to really set the world back. I mean, the U.S. back hugely. I just found this very uh, all of these threads go together because last week we talked about Turkey becoming the the you know, energy thread is big because last week we talked about Turkey becoming the natural gas hub. This week, this comes out. I mean, it's all in threaded in with all of a sudden, oh, wait a minute. It also means that Russia is now <laughs> has a better GDP growth than the U.S. Yeah, very interesting. It's it's oh my gosh. Welcome to Earth Day. Earth Day 2024. <laughs> Biden's damaging war against energy um, uh, American energy production. This one is I uh, got a lot in this article, and it comes down to um a couple points. This is from the hill. Uh, there is uh, the bottom couple paragraphs here, Michael. This isn't just incompetence, although there's plenty of that. It's an ide ideological effort to smother American energy along with the jobs and income it generates. There is a boom in oil production by waging war against it. President Biden could make it more resilient, uh, more could make us more reliant on OPEC. Venezuela and Russia and the I, uh, years ahead. 
this is coming up into a lot of different things. The LNG ban that you and I talked about is just absolutely part of this. And it is also in the geopolitical things. Think about the economy. If we could help our own environment by getting rid of coal, yay, from a standpoint of going to natural gas. Well, if we make more natural gas, we can export more and it's already dirt cheap and better for the environment. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, again, the, the, the devil's advocate here is that Everyone's making money right now at eighty dollar oil. We're, right. We there, there's a lot of activity going on. The you know, and we're about to cover specifically the diesel prices. Finally, diesel prices have come down to a specific level because I love how the title of the next article implies that low diesel prices are somehow bad because that means growth isn't happening. Well, it also means we can transport things a lot farther. And for cheaper, and we see lowered inflation. So some of this is a little bit of topsy turvy. Yes, we would all love President Trump to get elected, well, but he's going to massively lower oil price just by the effect of having his hand on the lever, and that's going to, you know, these these revenue, all this revenue that we're making right now may go away. So it's weird. The war on oil actually makes it more valuable. Let's go to rooftop solar panels that are flooding California's grid, and that's a problem. This one is, holy smokes, Batman, as electricity, the subtitle is, as electricity prices go negative, the Golden State is struggling to offload a glut of solar power. Michael, the old dreaded duck chart is in this article. And if, uh, Miss Producer, we could bring this chart up. In California, ample solar power floods the grid in the middle of the day. And you can see that the yeah. duck is alive and well. Duck's stoop is rolling here. Um, here's the problem. The grid upper, known as Casio, later dubbed the effect as the duck curve. Um and they have had some serious problems. Homeowners are expecting money back uh, when it's been sold this way for all of the rooftop solar. The grid mm -hmm. operator now cannot give money back. All the money for these homeowners have a 10-year payback in order to make it uh, available for them. The battery storage is not working. This is an absolute disaster. Here's a quote from Michelle Davis. These are not insurmountable challenges. The head of global solar at the energy research consulting firm, Wood uh, McKenzie, but they are challenges that a lot of grid op operators have never had to deal with nor do they have a government agency that understand how to fix it. <laughs> yeah, it's the unintended consequences when your grid cannot handle the supply that it's taking or it's not optimized to take that. I mean, you know, this is a second and third order effect that, you know, on the show we talk about is coming, but I don't think the public or the people who are setting the policies even know. No, uh, absolutely not. And, and you know, Michael, um, I absolutely love solar panels. I love, I'm trying to figure it out. You know that I've got uh, dual generators coming online uh, for propane. I got hydro from my local yeah. hydro. Uh, I got solar panels. I love solar panels. I love me building this entire mm -hmm. mini grid in my compound. I'm telling you what though, it's a nightmare. I, but then again, I'm using this as a learning curve. I do love the sitting there going, I'm I'm like a little kid looking at that meter going, I get free energy. And I look over at the bill, how much I paid for the solar versus how much my free hydro is. Huh. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, very interesting. And of course, this is happening in California. Can't get yeah, that's obviously uh it, it makes us laugh. You gotta love our buddies over there in California. Tesla absolutely getting crushed. First off, you know, Tesla reports biggest revenue slide since 2012 and announces uh renewed push for affordable 
model. So to give you guys a heads up here, Tesla reported about a 9% drop in revenue in the first quarter, their steepest year-over-year decline since 2012. Um, that corresponds uh, to about a stock price that's down more than 40% year over uh, year, uh, since the beginning of the year, which absolutely brings their, which is absolutely crazy considering where their valuation was to where that is now. I want to go ahead and bring up this, this article, Miss Produce. If you don't mind showing up Tesla quarterly revenues by segment, you can see all categories, um, or, or excuse me, you can see all categories there, but mainly total automotive revenues take a big hit. Services and energy generation plus storage actually stay uh, relatively the same. We saw Tesla's automotive revenue declined seven or thirteen percent relative. So you can see there's actually a little bit of growth in the services and the energy generation, which is super interesting. Tesla fans not too happy right now. The Tesla went ahead and sent it its shareholder deck that volume growth rate may be notably lower than the growth rate it achieved in 2023, which is interesting on the backs of the fact they didn't already hit their revenue. Now they're going to say it may possibly, possibly be lower. Who knows? Um, you know, they also did mention that they're really looking at, you know, affordable models, this quote unquote new vehicles, including more affordable models, be able to produce um, on the same quality manufacturing lines. So, I mean, it's clear with the in, as we've seen with the Chinese EVs, as they've come into the market and tried to lower that price down, it's either a race to the bottom on price or a race to the top. And I think Tesla is being smart and doing both. If I'm going to bet on anybody, it's Tesla. But I do think there are some rocky, rocky roads ahead, and it'll be interesting to see how they go about doing this. Um, as you can see, the quarterly net income. If you scroll down later in the article, we can also just toss that image up here. Tesla quarterly net income. They're pretty crazy um, in 2024 um, or, or in uh, in first quarter 2024. Um, so if if you want to talk about um, some of a, a reversion to the mean, you know, absolutely, absolutely unbelievable. Revenue came in as I, you know, they it was a 9% drop in revenue. You know, they had about $27.1 billion in revenue um, uh, earlier in the year. Uh, in the more in the morning, we saw analysts expecting about a $22.3 billion, barrel, uh, billion um, dollar print. So, yeah, it, you know, I mean, well, what, what do you expect? Again, I think it's a race. About, it's going to be very interesting to see where Tesla goes. But I'm going to bet on anybody. It's going to be Elon Musk figuring this out because um, he hasn't proved us wrong. Reuters estimates Russian oil and gas revenue to double in April. Top three bullet points here. Russia is expected to pocket $14 billion in April from oil and gas. Um, Russia's oil and gas revenues um, have slumped by about 23% um, compared to 20 or last year compared to 2022. Uh, but Reuters is also estimating that Russian revenues from the oil and gas in 2024 are going to be 30% higher or 50% higher than 2022 um, compared to 2023. So absolutely incredible right now. Um, this month, Russia, again, reading straight from the article, um, is estimated to uh, pocket about $14 billion. And that's about double where it was last year from about seven billion dollars um you know it's 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 pretty interesting you know Reuters estimates that um again that 30 percent increase between 2023 and 2024 um, would be kind of record revel amounts uh, for russia and i give this as Stu. if Stu was on this he would say this as again, evidence of the sanctions aren't working. We know that Russian crude is banned by the West, but they've been able to find buyers like China, India, and now more recently, Russian LNG, which has begun arriving in, in a bunch of different European uh, ports, has continued to flow. They've been able to basically de-dollarize their economy and continue to sell, clearly sell their product on the open market by making these direct trades. So this is, again, proof that sanctions don't necessarily work. And you have to think about the second order effects as we continue to roll this out.